Hi folks, it's good to be with you. I just want to I just want to uh, talk about um, the canon, uh, the formation of the canon in the New Testament. I just want to share you my thoughts. I've been doing a bit of research tonight and I uh, want to share you my uh, thoughts. You can uh, hook me up on uh, hook me up on the uh, on my website Jason Burns uh, Preacher dot uh, com uh, Jason Burns Preacher dot uh, com um, so I, I just want to talk about the formation of the New Testament canon. Um, first of all, there's a question that we have to ask. How do we verify the New Testament canon? Um, this is a very important question. And... As you answer it, it gives you a difference between the Catholic and the Protestant evangelical view. Um, and also, uh, if you're doing any scholarship, it kind of helps you to know uh, where you're at from a scholarly uh, point of view. Now, if you look at the Westminster Confession, if you look at um, Turretin, uh, a theologian, and also a modern scholar called Kruger, they put the emphasis that the New Testament canon is the New Testament canon because the New Testament is inspired of God and gives witness to itself uh, from, from the Holy Spirit. Um, this is a very significant position because if the New Testament bears witness to itself, its authority is not given by the church, but its authority is derived within itself. Okay, so it's very, very important to, to recognize that. If you don't say that the New Testament bears witness to itself as inspired, then you're at the mercy of historical inquiry. Now, uh, B.B. Warfield, a scholar that uh, I did a video on uh, a few days ago, and Charles Hodge, uh, sorry, A. H. Hodge, um, were very strong on the importance of the historical verification of the New Testament uh, from looking at the apostolicity, apostolicity of, uh, the gospel, uh, of, of the New Testament. So that there were certain historical ways of verifying the New Testament, and that we can go and look at that, how the early church fathers did that. Now I read B.B. Warfield, and he was uh, absolutely brilliant uh, from a historical point of view. And I would encourage you to go and read that video, uh, go and listen to that video, and go and read the article. Uh, and you know I love B.B. Warfield. I, I love A. H. Hodge. I read A. H. Hodge's article. Um, it, it was a lecture that he gave her over a hundred and odd years ago uh, on the formation of the canon and it's an excellent lecture and I've got, I'd encourage you to go and read it. But I do think that it's very important to emphasise, as the Westminster Confession, as Turretin and Kruger emphasised, the importance of the New Testament verifying itself inwardly, the inward testimony of the Holy Spirit and the fact that the New Testament is Christological. But, but, there is this important issue of the historical verification. Whether we like it or not, we have to go to history and see what happened in history. Now, if the church gave the New Testament its authority, then 
there's a problem there because if there are any anomalies, any difficulties within that presentation, it would weaken the veracity of the New Testament. Because the argument could go that the choice of the church was confused and sometimes arbitrary in its choice of the New Testament. And therefore there could be books added to the New Testament or even taken away from the New Testament. So do you get, my, do you get what I'm saying? So if, yeah, I'll, I'll refer this again, this is key. If the New Testament's authority is based upon the church, then it leaves it open to attack, the canon to attack, because then the church is anywhere in, within history where the church might seem to be confused, could be charged that they've made the wrong choice or the or uh, and that books should come out or go in. So it's important to hold on to, first of all, that the New Testament verifies itself. So that when we go to historic inquiry, we're not at the mercy of history, of historical inquiry. Right. So, I've been doing a little bit of investigation and I, I read uh, two, three, three main documents that I just want to bring your attention to. The first one is Origin. Now, Origin, um, 185-253, maybe 254, among anti-Nicene writers of the Eastern Church, the greatest by far was Origen, both as a theologian and pro pro prolific biblical scholar. According to Eusebius, Eusebius Origen was born of Christian parents in Egypt, probably about 185, and spent most of his life in Alexandria. In the year 203, Origen was appointed by Demetrius, the bishop, and succeeded Clement, head of the Catechus School in Alexandria. For a, a dozen years he carried on the work with marked success and with increasing numbers of pupils at the school. So what I did is I looked at Origen's quotations of the New Testament. And what, what I find here is that all of the New Testament, apart from James, 2 Peter, 2 John, and 3 John, is he believes the scripture. Now, James 2 Peter 2 John and 3 John, he is um, he's saying there's disputes about these books. Um, there are other writings such as the Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Hebrews, Acts of Paul, 1 Clement, Epistle of Barnabas, Dedicate, Shepherd of Hermes. One writer says, and the other times, Origen accepts as Christian evidence any material he finds convincing or appealing, even designated Christian things writings as divinely inspired. But then there are certain books, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of the Twelve, Gospel of uh, Basilius, Gospel of the Egyptians, Gospel of Matthew, uh, preaching of Peter, where he, he completely denies the authenticity of these writings. Now, when... When Origen is quoting these ones that where he, he seems to favour them and thinks they're good, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Hebrews, Acts of Paul, 1 Clement, Epistle of Barnabas, Dedicate, Shepherd of Hermes, he in no way quotes them on the same mass or on the same authority as the rest of the New Testament, Paul's epistles, uh, the Gospels, etc. So what that tells me is very, very clearly there, right early on in the church, already the canon of the New Testament was already there. Now you might think, well that's a very strange statement to make from what you're saying. What we see here is, is that Origen is very clear about the very core of the New Testament, Paul's epistles and the Gospels. That Throughout the church, the church in variety of places did see James, 2 Peter, 2 John and 3 John as the word of God. But in some places there were disputes about them. 
It wasn't that they were completely rejected. So already right in the early church we have uh, an unwitting uh, admittance here that the New Testament is already being seen as the Word of God. And these other books that are being quoted, Gospel of Peter, Gospel of Hebrews, Acts of Paul, 1 Clement, Epistle Barnabas, Dedicate, Shepherd of Hermes, Hermes, they're really being used in the overlapping of the apostolic tradition. Um, like, for example, 1 Clement was known to have known the apostles and was seen as of high authority. So these books would have been used, some of these books would have been used uh, and seen as very significant and important because they overlap the apostolic period. That's very important and gives you clarity, real clarity, in understanding the very confused nature of the situation with the canon. So then we have the Moratorian Canon is our next piece of evidence. In a manuscript of the 8th century in the Ambrose Library in Milan, probably written in uh, Bebbio, the L.A. Moratori, 1672-1750, discovered a catalogue in Latin of the New Testament writing with comments. He published the text, called after him the, the Canon Motoria. 740, four fragments of the canon were found in 1897 in four manuscripts of the 11th and 12th centuries in Montesino, the beginning of probably also the end of the catalogue, are missing, presumably the text derived from the West was composed about 200 AD. So we have the Moratorium Fragment, which is about 200 AD. In this, it pretty much uh, concurs with Origen, the book, the very core of the New Testament. The Gospels, Paul's epistles, are accepted, are accepted as the Word of God. The writer is very, very clear that there are false writings that are coming, that have come, and are to be rejected. There's one or two uh, books. John, he says this, John are accepted in the Catholic Church and the wisdom written by friends of Solomon in his honour. Also of the revelations we accept, those of John and Peter, later some of our people do not want to have read in the church. But Hermas wrote the shepherd quite lately in our time in the city of Rome when, when on the throne of the church of the city of Rome, Bishop of Pius. Now, again, there's a few anomalies like uh, Origin, where there are some books like the Book of Wisdom there as seen as scripture. But it's very, very clear that the bulk of the New Testament there is, is accepted. There might be a, a discussion about one or two, a couple. But already, we're seeing in the time of Origin, with the Moratorium Fragment and what Origin's saying, our belief that the New Testament is the Word of God and it bears witness to itself is already taking place within the early church. There is this sense that the bulk of the New Testament is the Word of God and there are some issues concerning a few books but it's not um, monolithic. It's not like the whole church has said uh, 1 John is not the Word of God. It's just some ch of the church is debating that issue, etc. And there's more and more clarity coming on the false on the books that are not in the New Testament. So now we come to Athanasius, and Athanasius uh, 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 in Alexandria, thirty-nine, festal letter of Athanasius, uh, three six seven. In his letter here, very clearly says, continuing, I must without hesitation mention the scripture of the New Testament. The other thought, now I find this incredible, I find this incredible. He says, continuing, I must without hesitation mention the scripture of the New Testament. They are the following four Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, after then the Acts of the Apostles. 
So there we have absolute solid clear evidence that there is this clear now demarcation between the New Testament and other gospel, other writings. What we see here is the New Testament is bearing witness to itself to the church and the church is becoming more and more discerning and accepting those books. It's not that the church decided what books should go in, it's the church becoming aware that these books are authoritative. So, why is this important? This is important. This is really, really important. Because if you don't know your stuff, if you don't do your research, you're going to get absolutely destroyed by anybody who will say to you in the Sinaiticus, Vaticanus, and whatever, there is an apocryphal book there and it was accepted at scripture and some of the early fathers are quoting from other literature that's not uh, in the New Testament and they saw that as scripture. And if you get these kind of arguments, your, your mind is just going to be blown away and you're going to be totally confused. But if you, rem if you remember that the New Testament bears witness to itself, if you remember that early on in the church, the bulk of the New Testament was accepted, that the few books that were, there were disputes about, those books were not completely rejected in the church. It was some of the church did, was confused about those books. But that is an indirect testimony to the authenticity of those books. On the flip side, some books that were seen as scripture, like Hermes and Dedicae and Clement's letter, the reason why they were seen as scripture at the time, and this is key, is that they overlapped in the, at the apostolic tradition. You see, you had the apostles, but then you had people who they trained, like Clement. And because they were so seen as uh, rooted and grounded within the apostolic tradition, that tradition was accepted. But the New Testament came to be real, that, that, but people began to realise that the New Testament was the authoritative embodiment of that apostolic tradition. And that these other writers like Clement, Hermes and Dedicae, though they were uh, maybe close to the apostles, were not on the same level. And in fact, even Clement, I think, makes that clear that he's not on the same level as the apostles. So uh, the church grew in more and more clarity on that issue. And that's why there was the confusion in quoting some of these other books as, as um, authoritative because they were rooted in the apostolic tradition, in the overlap of the New Testament. Um, so I hope that gives you clarity. Uh, it gives me clarity. It helps me to have a much more clearer understanding. Um, B.B. Warfield said some really good things, but th this study that we're doing here is really what we've done here. Uh, we, re we read an article by a, an old scholar, B.B. Warfield, but here, what I've done is I've brought your attention to primary source material. I've, I've brought your attention to origin and what he says, to the moratorium fragment, what that says, and to... Um, Athanasius of what, what he says. So we've looked at primary source historical material and we've, we've tried to grapple with it and we've looked at it from a theological point of view and then we've looked at it, we've looked at the canon from a theological point of view and then we've looked at it from a historical point of view. But saying that it's the theological that helps us to do the historical. But if you go purely to the historical Without the theological, you'll get yourself into a mess. Hope that's a help. Okay, thank you for listening. God bless you.